Good evening, everyone, and welcome from New Canaan Library. I'm Anthony Maricola, Manager of Adult Services, and I hope everybody's doing well. For tonight's program, I want to welcome back Professor Mark D. Van Els. Mark D. Van Els is a professor of history at Queensborough Community College of the City University of New York. He receives his PhD in history from the University of Wisconsin in 1999, and he's a native of the Badger State. Prior to his position at Queensborough, he taught at Mount Scenario College and the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Van Els also served as archivist historian at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum in Madison. His research specialties include the cultural history of US military, immigration and ethnicity, World War II and popular culture. Mark writes scholarly works as well as books and articles for general audiences on history and travel. Tonight, he will speak on the golden age of the postcard. If you have any questions for Professor Van Els this evening, please use the Q&A feature that's located at the bottom of your screen. Professor Van Els, welcome and thank you. The virtual floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Anthony. And uh, thank you everyone for logging in this evening. Uh, the topic of my talk this evening is the humble little postcard. It's something that we see in our everyday lives. It's so common, in fact, that we oftentimes give it uh, very little thought. We've all received them, we've all sent them, we've all purchased them. Uh, but if you went back to the early part of the 20th century, um, America and the world, in fact, was gripped in a postcard craze. This was a uh, a period known as the golden age of the postcard. Uh, let me read you a quote from a postcard collector of the period just to give you sort of a sense of the time. Um, and he wrote, quote, the postcarditis, equating it at, with the disease, of course, postcarditis has made its appearance in nearly every city and town in America with a vengeance. Thousands are afflicted with the disease and more are afflicted each day. Statistics from abroad indicate the same conditions. There is scarcely a store in any city or town that does not display those little squares of postboard. So these um, little objects were everywhere. Uh, so what I'd like to do tonight is talk about this golden age of the postcard. We'll talk about the origin of the postcard, um, what sorts of themes you found in postcards of the time. Um, and then I want to talk about the postcard during the First World War. This, of course, is the biggest international event to occur um, during this golden age of the postcard. And postcards were very important to the folks back home um, and very important to soldiers in the field as well. Um, it helped them express their uh, views of the war, their hopes of the war, and of course communicate with uh, friends and relatives back home as well. So let's begin by talking about the origins of the postcard, and the origins of the postcard are a little bit murky. Uh, it certainly came with the beginning of modern postal systems in the early to mid 19th century. This is where you start to have uh, uh, stamps and envelopes as we know them. There's an international postal union that's created. So basically the postal um, system that we know today begins to take shape at this time. Um, so far as is known, the first postcard in history was created in Great Britain in 1840. And this is uh, what it looked like. It was created by a playwright, um, someone also had a rep who had a reputation as a practical joker. His name is Theodore Hook. Um, and he created this image of a group of postal workers and sort of a buffoonish within buffoonish caricatures. He created this postcard and he mailed it to himself. Now exactly what he was trying to do is unclear. He must have sort of thought that maybe the people at the post and the postal service uh, would look at this caricature of them and maybe get a laugh at, out of it. Maybe he was trying to send a message. It's not quite clear. Uh, but so far as is known, this is generally considered to be the world's first postcard. Uh, now, they didn't catch on for a while, but by the 1860s, you begin to see this idea come up again. Americans had the idea, too. In Philadelphia, there was a printer named John Charlton. Uh, he worked um, with another person in Philadelphia named Hyman Lippman, and they came up with Lippman's postal card, uh, a very simple um, rectangular um, 
thing, a little box in the in, in the upper right hand corner for the uh, stamp, uh, some lines that you to, so that you can address the postcard to the person it's intended to, and then on the other side it was blank, and that's where you write your message. Uh, so that's the first American postcard. Um, and it was in the 1860s that uh, other places began to develop this idea of a postcard as well. You can send a letter, that's fine, but maybe you can just get rid of the envelope altogether. That might be even more simple. Uh, now, the country that first authorized postcards was Austria. In 1869, they um, created what they called the Correspondence Carta. It was pre, it was, uh, the postage was prepaid, um, basically a blank card. Um, and in 1869, this becomes the first nationally authorized postcard. Uh, it spreads to other countries pretty quickly. The first U.S. penny postcards come in the year 1873. And it's also during this time that there are some important advances happening in lithography, uh, in printing technology. Technology, uh, so it becomes more easy and cost efficient to print more complicated kinds of things. And of course, this is the dawn of photography as well. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard the saying before, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and people liked to get these images um, in the mail, either an etching or a photograph something like that, um, it, it, it did um, express ideas, um, convey sentiments in a very effective way. Uh, now, there were some concerns about this new medium. There, for example, were concerns about privacy. Uh, if you send a postcard, the people in the postal services can read what you have to say. Um, is the government going to be snooping on your correspondence? Now, of course, there were so many of these postcards eventually that were mailed um, that postal workers did not have the time, not to mention the inclination to read all these things. They, of course, just passed them on. Uh, there were also concerns that the, the postcard was a little bit uh, lowbrow. I guess you could say a proper correspondence is a well-composed letter, uh, just jotting down a few things and popping it in the mail. Uh, that really didn't seem like the proper way to communicate for a lot of people. So there were those who weren't crazy about this new medium, uh, but many more liked it. And the popularity of these postcards begins to grow and grow. And then in the first decade of the 20th century, you begin to see the so-called called divided back postcard. And on your screen here is an example of this. And this, of course, is the postcard that we've all become familiar with today. Uh, on the front side, of course, is the image. Um, but on the reverse side, you divide it into one, one space is for writing the letter. The other, of course, is for the address and the little box for um, the stamp. Um, and with this, the postcard, as we know it, um, is born. Um, and there were many, many, many reasons to send postcards. Um, even today, we think of postcards primarily as a souvenir of travel. Now, the word souvenir, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, comes from the French uh, to uh, the verb to remember. Um, and souvenirs are oftentimes a way to uh, rekindle the memories of your trip. The travel experience, of course, is very ephemeral. Um, but if you have a physical object, it can help you trigger memories. So people on vacation, even today, pick up all kinds of knickknacks. Knickknacks, I'm sure you have many um, in your homes as well. Uh, and of course, a postcard was a way to rekindle those memories as well. A visual cue, a visual image to help you remember your trip. Um, it was also a way, frankly, to show off where you've been, right? You mailed this postcard to someone else and say, hey, I'm in Paris and you're not. Hey, I'm in Toledo and you're not. So there were postcards from just about any location of any size. Uh, there were postcards from um, the, some of the various world's fairs that occurred at the time, Chicago in 1893, Paris in 1889, uh, St. Louis uh, 1904. Um, 
So you could show off where you've been with a postcard and you could um, remember your trip with a postcard as well. Again, that's what we mostly think of um, the use of the postcard today. Um, Oh, I'll show you these pictures here as well. Uh, a beach vacation, you can certainly show off the beach and what a good time uh, you had at the shore or what have you. You could find other postcards from mountain trips, famous cities, uh, et cetera. Uh, but there were lots of other kinds of postcards out there. There were almost a, um, an infinite variety of them. Uh, some artists viewed the postcard as a way to share their creation, to share their art, um, either through lithography or through painting. Um, it was a way for artists to show off what they're doing and publicize what they're doing, of course. Uh, the British company Raphael and Tuck, uh, for example, they came up with a whole series of postcards they called oilettes. And these were basically copies of uh, oil paintings, um, typically of uh, scenes around the British countryside, the shore, like you see here. Um, so there were many artists who viewed this as a way to express themselves and um, uh, share their work. Uh, I will add that uh, in Vienna, Austria at this time, there was a struggling artist named Adolf Hitler who created some postcards as well. Um, so this was a fairly common thing for artistic people, um, a, a way, again, a way for them to share their art and creation. Uh, it was also a way for many people to keep up with current events. Um, Again, photography in particular, you could uh, send uh, photographs of some historical events. Um, the, in 1904, for example, a war break broke out between Japan and Russia. So this Russo-Japanese Russo war stimulated many different kinds of postcards. Again, photographs were novel at the time. It was the first time that a lot of people could really see an image of um, uh, well, China, Korea, uh, what a battlefield looked like, etc. Postcards could also depict uh, maps of the region, like you see here. This is a German postcard uh, from the Russo-Japanese War. Um, so it was a way to exchange information, uh, uh, get a sense of um, what the battlefield looked like. Um, uh, so current events was a common theme in these postcards. Uh, postcards were a way to make a political statement, uh, campaigning for a particular candidate, uh, try to publicize a particular issue. Here on the left, of course, you see a postcard uh, promoting women's voting rights, which was a major social cause and political cause at the time. So if you want to make a political statement, um, maybe send a card to someone who might sympathize you with you, maybe send a postcard to someone who might not sympathize with you. If you want to make that statement, uh, you can mail a postcard that'll uh, put your political views out there. Uh, you can also share a little humor with a postcard. Uh, we all like to share a joke and tell a joke now and then. Well, you could do that with postcards as well. Um, of course, artists like to um, uh, play around and experiment with imagery. Um, so post this, so you could send um, a joke with postcards. Um, one common use for postcards at this time were holiday greetings. Um, and at this time, the greeting card companies are also going as well. So there's a little bit of competition here, uh, but a postcard was a nice way to send holiday greetings to people as we still do to this day. Um, you know, and it's, you know, we're, uh, seemingly obliged to in many cases. Uh, so here's a nice Christmas postcard, um, pleasant little scene, holiday greetings. There of course are any number of different holidays for which you can you could send a postcard. Uh, here's Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, Valentine's cards are uh, uh, obligatory with some today, uh, but you could send a postcard to celebrate the 4th of July. Uh, 
Halloween. Uh, of course, there were birthday greetings and uh, these sorts of uh, occasions as well. Uh, so it was a nice way to send a graphic sentiment the same way that uh, we really, the same way that we do today. Uh, many looked to postcards for religious inspiration. Um, uh, you know, these images uh, give a lot of people comfort, especially in times of uh, stress or distress. Uh, maybe you want to send a religious sentiment. Of course, you could send uh, cards for Easter, uh, Passover, other uh, religious holidays as well. Again, many people find these images comforting. Uh, postcards were a way to uh, express those sentiments. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum here, you could send postcards that were a little bit uh, risque. Now, this period here in the early 20th century is sort of uh, famous for its uh, um, uh, sexual repression, I guess you can say, but that certainly that was a part um, of life at the time, and many postcards covered such, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, such naughty topics, I guess you can say, uh, some more explicit than, uh, than others, you know, some uh, um, a little more subtle, uh, some a bit more Frank, uh, I put a few examples on the screen here. There were, there are plenty more examples out there of cards that are a bit more um, erotic, uh, either for artistic purposes or simply for the purposes of uh, uh, of uh, a thrill. Uh, there were even not just so much erotic postcards, but there were pornographic postcards as well. These obviously could not be sent through the mail, uh, but people collected these images. Uh, there are people who study the history of pornography, and in fact, they note that the postcard was a very important turning point in that uh, particular industry, shall we say, up until this time, uh, such erotic sentiments were typically sent by letter or people indulged in uh, uh, erotic or pornographic uh, pursuits uh, through literature. It was expressed in writing. Uh, with the postcard, uh, these sorts of things now become more um, graphic. Uh, you now, now more based on image than based on um, uh, the written word, uh, and they're much more freely available as well. Um, so again, postcards really ran the gamut, um, um, helping people to express their sentiments in many, many different ways. And postcards uh, came in many different forms. There were any number of different kinds of novelty cards. Uh, some might be big, some might be small, some might be particularly long. Uh, there were other um, unusual varieties of postcards here. On the, on the left-hand side of the screen, for example, it's a portrait uh, of a woman, uh, and that's not just a, uh, an image of a peacock feather, that is an actual feather that is glued to the postcard, and you found uh, any ver different, and many varieties of postcards that uh, had real feathers on it. Uh, sometimes real hair was glued glued onto the postcards. Uh, there were some postcards that were made of wood. Uh, the postcard on the right-hand side of the screen here, it is made of leather. Um, so these postcards not only had an infinite variety of subjects, uh, but they came in almost an in a great variety um, of formats as well. Uh, many, many different kinds of these uh, postcards out there. Um, so these were produced around the world, uh, but the undisputed king of postcard production in the world at the time was Germany. Um, and the postcard really seemed to reach into German popular culture more so than in many other countries around the world. In 1913 alone, uh, Germany produced 1.3 billion postcards. Now that's just in one year. Uh, many of them were for domestic 
consumption. Uh, Germany also produced postcards uh, for export. Uh, you could have your postcards printed in Germany and then sent to Britain or the United States or whatever country you liked. Um, the German postcard industry in particular was centered around the German cities of Leipzig, uh, Dresden, sort of um, uh, the southern part of East Germany today. Um, other countries, of course, produced them as well. Um, mostly European countries, the British uh, were probably in second place behind the Germans in postcard production. You could find them produced in Italy and Belgium and um, other parts of Europe. Uh, Japan in East Asia was also a major pr uh, producer of postcards. Um, mostly for a domestic um, audience. In fact, in 1913, Japan was second to Germany in postcard production. Um, between 1900 and 1914, this golden age of the postcard, according to one historical study, roughly 200 to 300 billion postcards were produced worldwide. Uh, so these little squares of pasteboard were everywhere. Um, as for the American postcard industry, the United States was in fact a major producer of postcards, sometimes ranking about second or third uh, in postcard production. Any number of different companies emerged uh, to produce them. Um, and there was an unusually high number of postcard companies that were created by German immigrants. So they're here, even in the American postcard industry, there is a German connection here as well. Now, most American companies did not have German connections, but uh, an unusually large number did. Uh, for example, the EC Crop Company, this is based in Milwaukee. It's a city uh, noted for its German connections. This was one of America's largest postcard producers. Crop was an immigrant from Germany, and one time he paid uh, a return visit to his home country, and he noticed the popularity of these postcards. Um, and he thought, well, geez, you know, um, Americans might like this too. Certainly lots of German immigrants in America uh, might enjoy these postcards. And so he comes back to, to the United States. He opens up a postcard factory in Milwaukee. Um, and by 1914, this company had produced something like 20 million postcards. Um, this postcard company even made postcards of its own factory, as you see on the screen here. Uh, and there were others as well. Uh, this is the Holtzman uh, Company in Chicago, the souvenir postcard company reputed to be uh, the largest factory in the United States. Uh, um, in the United States to, devoted specifically to their production of postcards. Here again, you could get a postcard of the postcard factory. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but uh, apparently some people wanted these. Um, so when I say you can get a postcard of just about anything, uh, you can get a postcard of just about anything. Uh, so this was a growing and significant industry in the United States as well. And you could buy postcards in many different kinds of places, certainly in a hotel, in a place you might be traveling to, other sorts of gift shops that you might find uh, that cater to tourists. Uh, there were also shops that were dedicated specifically to postcards, where you walk into the store and that's all they sell are postcards. Uh, there was another German immigrant in Chicago. His name was Otto Kane. Uh, he established a postcard shop in Chicago. Uh, it turned out to be a fabulous success. Uh, he opened a whole chain of postcard stores in the Chicago area. Um, and he bragged that he had the money to buy a fancy car and a new house and all these things just with the money made from postcards. Um, so there was certainly money in it. Uh, there were even postcard vending machines. Uh, 
The one you see on your screen here, it's got baseball cards in it, but it's the same basic principle. You can sort of flip, flip a lever um, and browse at the different cards that you might like to buy. And if you want to, you put the coin in, turned another button and the postcard came out. Uh, so there were many different ways to purchase these items. And in addition to those postcards that were produced in factories, uh, in the early 20th century, now people could produce their own postcards. Uh, so the infinite variety of postcards becomes even more so. Um, and this has to do with the rise of popular photography. So the, the connection between the postcard and the history of uh, um, photography is very closely intertwined. Photography, as some of you I'm sure are aware, uh, this was developed in the 19th century. This is when the first photographic images really uh, come from. And in the beginning, photography was something that was um, uh, very difficult. It was it involved a lot of machinery, uh, oftentimes expensive machinery. It took a certain amount of skill. Uh, so most people, when they participated in photography, what they did was they sat for a professional photographer who would then take their picture. Taking photographs was for a small, specialized, um, well-trained group of people. Uh, but towards the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, that starts to change. Photography is effectively democratized. Uh, cameras for ordinary people begin to emerge. Uh, and here's where the famous Kodak Company of Rochester, New York comes in. They make um, cameras uh, not for professionals, but for the ordinary person. Um, and some of these postcards, some of these uh, cameras were made specifically for the production of postcards. They were sometimes called the postcard camera. Uh, here, for example, is maybe the most famous of them, the Kodak Model 3A. Um, so anyone could take a photograph. Many of these so-called postcard cameras, they had a little window in the back where you could actually write a caption. Um, and then of course you could print the images. Uh, you printed the images right on postcard stock with the divided back um, uh, already pre-printed. You could buy those in advance print the images onto the postcard stock, and then you could make as many postcards as you like. Uh, these kinds of postcards uh, were known as real photo postcards. Um, and again, these come in, uh, in many, many different varieties. Uh, the same way that we take photographs today, of whatever we take photographs of today, people were taking photographs of back then, maybe not so much their dinners. I know people take photographs of their meals these days. Um, I haven't seen any of those personally, but just about anything else. You could take a photograph of your family reunion. You could take a photograph of your marching band, as you see, here. You could take a photograph of your street, you could take a photograph of your school, of just about any scene in your town, um, and then you could print up as many copies as you liked. Uh, typically, these real photo postcards, uh, people usually only printed up uh, maybe a few dozen for friends and family or someone like that. Um, some They could be mass-produced, however. Um, and so this is a way for someone to share what their community looks like with people, uh, share photographs with family members, um, share photographs of your vacation, you know, with the real photo postcard. Now you, you can do more than just send a photograph um, you can, I'm sorry, you could do more than just send a postcard from Paris. You could send a photo, you could send a postcard of yourself in Paris. Um, so, 
those who study American social history and everyday life, genealogy and these kinds of things, um, these, these real photo postcards are a very important uh, resource, oftentimes the only photographic evidence we might have of distant um, relatives or even famous people, uh, historical events and historical events that are good and historical events that are bad as well. Some of the events that photographers captured were things that are very horrifying and distasteful. But as part of this postcard craze, uh, particularly but not limited to the southern part of the United States, were what were called lynching cards. Lynching was a, an all too common practice in the South, um, aimed primarily at African Americans and other um, um, minority groups in the South as well. Um, and during these horrific events, sometimes people took photographs um, with these postcard cameras, and then they printed up copies of these postcards um, to share the experience and to publicize the event. As shocking and horrifying as that is, you can find these lynching postcards out there as well. It's almost sort of its own uh, sad sub-genre. Uh, and I'll get these images off your screen um, now. Another reason to collect postcards is the fact that they were collectible. And there are lots of people who like to collect lots of things. Again, I suspect many people out there tonight have their own collections. People collect spoons and people collect napkins and baseball cards and who knows what else. Well, one thing a lot of people collected during this golden age of the postcard was postcards um, in the hundreds. In the thousands, uh, there was one postcard collector who claimed to have a collection of 300,000 postcards. Um, where he or she put them, I do not know, but that is a pretty significant collection. Uh, there were postcard projectors, and so you could invite the neighbors over and you could show off your postcards. Uh, I'm sure we've all sat through uh, your friend or relative showing the, uh, the slides of their vacation. Well, that's not anything particularly new. You can show off your postcards as well. In fact, the uh, image on the, the, lo the lower image there, you see a postcard projector. There were postcard albums. Um, much like you might find it at a Michael's today or something like this, uh, where you could store those photographs. And you know, some were pretty simple. Uh, some were very elaborate with uh, leather backing or uh, wood borders or something like this. Um, and you could put that in a prominent place in your living room. You could show them off when company came over. Um, and of course, the kinds of postcards you had in your collection could also advertise your social status. If you had postcards from exotic foreign places that you may have visited or uh, New York City or someplace like this, you can show off um, where you've been. Um, and there were postcard collecting clubs, um, not only in the United States, but all around the world. And here again, many different kinds of postcard collecting clubs. Uh, there was one, for example, for people who knew how to write shorthand. I don't think anyone knows how to write shorthand today. Um, and these were people in the club sent postcards to each other that were only written in shorthand. There were international postcard clubs. Uh, you could send a postcard of your hometown, someone else in the club might send you a postcard of their hometown. So it helped you uh, get, in, get, get a, an image of uh, how different people uh, lived in different countries around the world. You became familiar, even friends with people in different countries around the world. Um, some even thought that postcard collecting was a way to uh, promote peace around the world as we shared our postcards. Uh, and of course, sending postcards was a way to get postcards, and that was a way to build your collection as well. Um, so of the many collectibles, postcards at this time was one of them. Um, 
But in 1914, uh, a war breaks out in Europe. This, of course, is the First World War. So whatever uh, global friendship postcard collecting may have created, it wasn't enough to stop this cataclysmic conflict uh, where one half of Europe basically went to war against the other half of Europe. Um, and this happened at the height of the postcard craze. And so uh, as people experienced the First World War, postcards were a very important part of that. As I think I said at the beginning of the presentation um, tonight, um, important for the folks back home, important for the soldiers, families are separated. So um, here's one way in which people can uh, remain connected and share news, send greetings. Uh, soldiers loved to get mail. Here's a French postcard. And I don't know uh, how many read French out there. The top line says, uh, the two friends of the soldier. And you've got the cook, of course, and you've got the mailman, because that the, the mail, the letters, these were lifelines to normal life, uh, and postcards were a one of many ways in which you could keep up those communications um, with the folks back home. Um, now, even though countries they mobilize their economies for the war effort. Uh, postcard production continues during the war. Uh, countries found this valuable, not just because it kept the soldiers happy. Um, postcards were a great way to spread propaganda as well. Uh, so if you look at postcards from the World War I era, um, there are oftentimes these very patriotic scenes. Here you see flags dramatically waving from all the different allied countries, um, photographs of uh, presidents and kings and kaisers and czars and whatever country you happen to be, um, postcard images that might stir up um, patriotic or nationalistic feelings, uh, help people to continue their support of the war. And of course, as the war drags on and on, that becomes more and more of a problem. So they were a vehicle for propaganda. Uh, the government, in fact, often governments oftentimes shared their official photographs with postcard producers. Um, Maybe most famously, the British newspaper Daily Mail contracted with the British Army. They got official photographs and they published a, um, a whole series of postcards. One historian has called this the most popular series of postcards ever in history. Maybe a little exaggerated. Maybe not. Uh, people were hungry for images of the front and what it was like and what their relatives were going through. Uh, just like postcards were important for uh, souvenirs in peacetime, postcards also became very important war souvenirs as well. Uh, soldiers are throughout history have long connect collected souvenirs to help them remember their wartime experiences. For soldiers, these souvenirs oftentimes have other meanings as well. Um, having a souvenir of the war um, shows that you were a participant, that you were part of this great global event, that you did something as a citizen um, to protect the country in its time of uh, crisis. The, the, these souvenirs sometimes became sort of a, a badge of their veteran status and their patriotic um, bona fides, I guess you can say. Uh, and soldiers collected all all kinds of different kinds of souvenirs, um, but one kind they collected were postcards. In fact, uh, postcards were ideal for uh, soldier souvenir collectors. It was hard for them to store, uh, let's say, a German helmet that they may have picked up, uh, but a postcard is easily mailed, it's easily kept. Um, and there were infinite varieties of them. Uh, again, real photo postcards were very common. Soldiers couldn't wait to get their pictures taken. There were photographers outside of military bases um, who were making a fair amount of money on the soldier trade. It was the same when they got to Europe as well. It might be surprising how close to the front some of these uh, photographers were. 
um, but there was a market for uh, these real photo postcards with soldiers. Um, sometimes even soldiers even made their own. If they had their own camera, if they could get their own cardstock, uh, they could produce their own photographs as well. So there was certainly a trade uh, for uh, soldier souvenirs. Um, in fact, you could purchase packets of wartime photographs. Uh, again, typically these were official government photographs that somehow ended up in the hands of uh, enterprising entrepreneurs um, who might sell you a package. You know, on the right is uh, an example of one of the packages. On the left is a typical kind of photograph that you might find in these uh, war souvenir packets. Um, that's a souvenir of the Great War, um, if you're not familiar with the French. Uh, here are some other examples, and sometimes these uh, postcard packets might not be 100% accurate. You know, there's money to be made here, and sometimes these producers cut corners or sometimes just didn't tell the truth. Uh, spelling errors, the, the postcard on your left says explosion and Cambria, uh, what they mean is Cambrai, it's a city in France. The one on the right says the Germans are retreating at the Battle of Bella Wood. That's almost certainly not true. Um, the mountains in the background, uh, the, these are not the kinds of hills that you find in that particular part of France. Um, of course, you have to wonder who's taking the photograph. This is very likely some uh, photograph of a training exercise um, that someone tried to pass off as a real combat photo. Um, so again, the veracity of some of these uh, images and these packets might be um, uh, open to question. Uh, postcards were a great way for some soldiers to express emotions that they might not be able to write down. Uh, the emotions of war are very complex. Uh, many soldiers were illiterate anyway, or semi-literate. And so again, getting back to the idea that a picture says a thousand words, um, these cards can express the soldiers' emotions in a way that they might not be able to write themselves. Um, I'll put these in here as well. Some of these souvenir postcards in France could be quite elaborate. These are made of silk. Uh, so these are uh, particularly nice things that you might send to a loved one uh, from France, again, to keep up those connections when you're, you know, in the American perspective, an ocean away. Uh, humor, uh, just as in peacetime, soldiers uh, sometimes laugh their troubles away as well, share humor. Uh, so this was um, a way to share those hum that humor. This is um, a cartoon that was turned into a uh, postcard by a British officer named Bruce Barnes' father. Um, the character on the right is Old Bill. He was sort of a gruff, older soldier, sort of the Willie and Joe of the First World War in Great Britain. Uh, so he made many comical cartoons like this. Uh, here's another one. Um, those images demeaning the enemy, the armies actually tried to suppress. They wanted soldiers to have a healthy respect for the, their opponents on the other side of the trenches, but you could find postcards like these uh, as well. Uh, just like in the civilian world, uh, there were soldier artists who shared their work as well. Um, and these postcards sometimes really begin to capture the soldier's perspective on the war, not the hyper patriotic uh, propaganda postcards, but uh, really capture what soldiers think and feel. I'll give you a couple of examples. There was a French artist named Ernest Gabbard. Uh, he was a notable artist before the war, ends up in the army. He produced a series of postcards that were circulated among the troops, uh, made it uh, behind the lines as well. Uh, this image you see here is not the kind of patriotic propaganda, but rather sort of the hardships, uh, the miseries of life in wartime. Uh, it's pouring rain, you're slogging through the mud, uh, you can almost sort of feel the cold um, in this image, and he of course would continue to be a notable French uh, artist after the war. 
Otto Schubert was an ordinary German soldier who became a noted artist after the war. He simply got his hands on some cardstock and painted some watercolors of the things he saw. Um, while in service, here's a landscape on a postcard. Um, here's an image of, uh, no, this is from the German perspective, of course. Here are some French prisoners um, of war. Um, here's another image, again, capturing sort of the darker, more threatening, uh, frightening images uh, from the front and life in the trenches. So these soldier portrayals were, you know, more, <coughs> excuse me, more gritty, um, more honest, uh, conveyed some of the real emotions of the soldiers. Um, of the postcard soldiers collected, and the people back home wanted to see, they oftentimes showed off the weaponry of the time, what were then considered the high tech weapons. Uh, uh, the First World War is the first time aircraft were uh, employed on the battlefield in a major way. It was uh, very romantic and very exciting. So people wanted to see images of the um, hardware that soldiers used. And of course, soldiers wanted to show these kinds of things off as well. Uh, scenes of destruction were quite common, but there were limits to what sorts of destruction were portrayed in postcards. Um, rarely in these postcard collections did you find images of the dead. First of all, governments suppressed these images. Now they did circulate, uh, but you could not mail them. Uh, they were typically produced in neutral countries like the Netherlands and ended up on both sides of the trenches. Uh, but the soldiers did not like these images themselves. And so when they collected their postcards, when they, they were picking which images they wanted to use to remember the war. Uh, they wanted to remember the weaponry. They wanted to remember the scenes of destruction. They wanted to remember their friends. Um, but this, these kinds of images were something that were painful enough that soldiers oftentimes uh, omitted these images. So even in these more honest, gritty images of soldier life, um, there were some that were too graphic and intense, um, even for the soldiers. All right, to wrap it up here, uh, the golden age of the postcard, the first two decades of the 20th century after the First World War. Uh, now, to be clear, the postcard never goes away. Uh, but as all fads do, the postcard craze does begin to burn out as we get into the 1920s. Um, there are more ways to communicate. Uh, telephone service now is much more reliable, um, better way to exchange news and information. Um, radio is a way to obtain news and information. There was competition from greeting cards as well. So again, the postcard never goes away, but it's um, the, the, uh, the the billions and billions that were produced during this period, um, that begins to taper off a bit. Uh, but these postcards do leave us with a, some very interesting and important and insightful images um, of these first two decades of the 20th century. It helps us understand what's on people's minds, what's important to them, um, you know, what they're thinking. And we saw this also with the soldier. Um, and in particular, how they wanted to remember the war. And these kinds of images have certainly not gone away in our culture either. Uh, you might notice some, some themes here in these postcards um, that we would see today in uh, media, social media like Facebook or Twitter uh, or something like this. Um, Many of you are probably Facebook users and you see the joke and you see the off-color joke and someone else always makes the political diatribe um, or what have you. Uh, these postcards in the early 20th century, I think are basically the equivalent of the memes and the tweets and the Facebook posts and the things like this that are very much a part of our culture 
today. The media has changed, but many of the sentiments um, and the mentality uh, has remained the same. Um, and with that, I thank you very much for your time and attention. All right. I'm looking at a question here. Are any postcard collections valuable? Uh, I should say, yes, they are. Um, there, there is almost sort of a, there is a whole world of uh, antique postcard collectors out there. And you can, you can well, first of all, you can find um, many in historical archives. Um, and if you just Google online, you can find uh, many different databases. Many of the images I showed tonight, for example, they come from the New York Public Library collection of postcards. Uh, there are several others out there. Uh, Raphael and Tuck, the company I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a database of some of their images. So there are lots of them out there. There are postcard collectors out there. I um, I have to confess, I my interest in the postcard is purely academic. Uh, I do know if you are an eBay user, and I am not, they are for sale, and some of them can capture uh, uh, they can uh, garner uh, quite a bit of money. I wouldn't have the first idea of how to price um, these sorts of things. You'd have to speak to someone who's involved in the trade there. Um, but there are there are numerous postcard enthusiasts out there um, who collect and display these. A, a Google search will bring you to a whole bunch of them. Another one I cited in the um, in the presentation here. It's a website called metropostcards.com. It's by a gentleman named Alan Petrillis. He's in, uh, I think, Queens. Uh, and he's uh, posted a, uh, not only lots of different images, but he gives a very nice little history of uh, postcard collecting and the history of the postcard as well. So again, we don't think of these very often, but uh, there, if you take a look, they're out there and there are a lot of enthusiasts. Uh, let's see, Ken Hecht, you said the late 20s was the height of the postcard craze. It's more in the first two decades of the 20th century, 19 aughts and the 1910s. By the, by the end of the First World War, um, the, the media environment starts to change. And so people get their news in other ways. Um, uh, Sue Maynard, a comment, the postcard following Gabar to the watercolor landscape. Seems to show bodies in the background. I didn't notice that. That could be. Uh, that could well be. But they're hidden in the background. They're they're not uh, out there um, prominently displayed. But that that certainly was part of the environment that these soldiers um, experienced. Yeah. What will be the new evolution of the postcard? Um, Will we go back to written and mailed communication? Geez, I don't know. His, uh, people think historians can predict the future. We're no better at it than anyone else. I And I'm not someone who thinks of myself as particularly media savvy. Um, I couldn't tell you. You know, even with texting, it's um, it's an abbreviation, but uh, people are writing. Uh, again, Facebook and these sorts of things, we share these sentiments. Um, it's hard to tell what the future will be. I, I, I wouldn't want to jump out on that ledge, I guess. Uh, there'll always be something new. Um, and yet, you know, when something new comes along, we'll find, we'll find some familiar themes along with that as well. Uh, human nature is what it is, I guess. Um, you know, from the religious experience to the sexual titillation, um, uh, political bloviating, what have you, that, those sorts of things are always going to be part of our uh, experience, no matter what the media happen to be, in my view. What was the rate of decline of the postcard from the 1920s on? Uh, I, I don't have any specific uh, figures on that. Um, if I could go back here, um, again, as I said, the postcard never goes away. Um, 
in World War II. I put an image here of World War II. This is from, um, you know, soldiers still send po postcards in World War II. Uh, we still send them today. Um, you know, of course, the populations are much larger as well. So what the number of postcards purchased per person was, I haven't ever seen that statistic before. Uh, I couldn't tell you a specific rate. Um, postcard production remained strong. I mean, it, it still is. You can still find postcards out there. Um, I occasionally get some, uh, normally from people who are over the age of 40 and even 50, but uh, there are still, they're still out there. You can still send them, um, but we do have other ways to share our um, sentiments as well. Professor Van Els, thank you so much for being with us this evening. It was oh, an sure. excellent it's, presentation. Thank you. It's my pleasure to come, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Hopefully we can have you back again in the near future. Send me an email. Wonderful. All right, everybody, thank you for attending. Um, have a wonderful evening. And um, thank you. Thank you all.